Okay, um, I'm gonna disappear now over to you, Clive. Right, thank you. Um, the Virginia is gonna to talk to us on the topic of sources and resources beyond Western humanism. Now, for those of you, uh, those, of, uh, those of us who don't know, uh, Dr. Bajini is a British philosopher and the author of well over 20 books on philosophy, atheism, secularism, and the nature of national identity. So he's um, a patron of Humanist UK. I just want to say thank you so much to Dr. Bajini for coming and uh, we just give him a warm virtual round of applause. <laughs> So I'll hand over to Dr. Virginia. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Clive, for that really, really uh, warm welcome. I think I can um, screen share now, which is uh, great. So let me just find the appropriate um, thing to share. Uh, typically, typically, what I can't do now is find what I'm supposed to be sharing. Oh, here we go. Good. Okay. So thanks very much. Um, thank you very much for having me. I really do appreciate coming here. Um, like you said, like Clive said, actually, it's interesting. You know, I've been to humanist meetings uh, many times over the years. And it is true that, you know, it does seem to be a surprisingly uh, white kind of movement. And, and why is that? And I'm sure there are many, many reasons for it. And I certainly don't want to give any sort of strong diagnosis for that. But I do think there is this interesting uh, question, which is a perception of humanism as somehow a kind of a, a Western thing. In some ways that's easily dismissed. There's the inter International Humanist uh, Organization, which has member organizations from all over the world. So as a matter of fact, there's clearly a very strong global element to it. But of course, within a particular country, the character that humanism takes is affected by that culture. And I just wonder whether or not humanism in the West is a bit more Western than it thinks it is and not quite as universal as it would like to be. Now, just say a little bit about you know, where I'm coming from about this. Um, now, I wrote a few years ago a book called How the World Thinks, and this was a book about global philosophy. And in writing it, I, and, and since, I don't claim that it has made me an expert on the world's philosophies. There are just simply too many of them. Uh, it's too diverse. I couldn't possibly be an expert, but I kind of approached it as a kind of philosophical journalist. And certainly, you know, having written it, it has sort of affected the, the way I think about things. And it's made me, I think, a bit more sensitive to ways in which certain ways of thinking may be betraying assumptions which are very Western and which are sometimes very questionable. So what I want to do today in talking about humanism is really just to share some thoughts and reflections uh, I can't give you a, a fully pinned down argument as such, but I want to suggest some of the ways in which perhaps the way humanism is framed and explained, particularly in, in the West, perhaps means that it's sort of unwittingly, if you like, cutting itself off from uh, resources from other traditions and perhaps is conceiving itself too narrowly. So if we start with us, well, what is humanism and there are many definitions I just want to go through a few this is what humanists uk says on its website and i've kind of highlighted what i think are the key uh, terms here so humanism is a movement of non-religious people who have believed that this life is the only life we have that the universe is a natural phenomenon with no supernatural side and that we can live ethical and fulfilling lives on the basis of reason and humanity they have trusted to the scientific method, evidence and reason to discover truths about the universe and have placed human welfare and happiness at the center of their ethical decision-making. You can imagine that that paragraph took many, many <laughs> versions to complete because it's very, very concise. I mean, I'm highlighting so many key things there, are so many ideas there, which the, the statement is trying to capture. And I think it does it uh, pr pretty well. Just to compare it with a couple of others and just to see the similarities and perhaps also a few little differences. So um, if we now, all right. So the concise Routledge Encyclopedia of Philosophy describes humanism as being a commitment to the perspective, interests and centrality of human persons. What's interesting about that is that I think historically, 
Uh, humanists would have said something like that in their own statements, but I think there's been a bit of a, a bit of a, um, what can we say, a bit of a uh, realization perhaps that uh, we don't want to be too human centric, that the, the animals and other animals need to be included in our moral vision. Anyway, a belief in reason and autonomy as foundational aspects of human existence. A belief that reason, scepticism, and the scientific method are the only appropriate instruments for discovering truth and structuring the human community. A belief that the foundations for ethics and society are to be found in autonomy and moral equality. So slightly different emphases there. One or two things aren't explicit in the Humanist UK statement, but nonetheless, it seems very similar. Let's just take a third one, Humanists International. Uh, the global perspective, if you like, they say humanism is a democratic and ethical life stance that affirms that human beings have the right and responsibility to give meaning and shape to their own lives. Humanism stands for the building of a more humane society through an ethics based on human and other natural values in a spirit of reason and free inquiry through human capabilities. Humanism is not theistic and it does not accept supernatural views of reality. So from those three statements, I think we can kind of come up with uh, some bullet points of what some of these key features of uh, what humanism are. And I've got at the bottom there, remind you of anything. I think as this list grows, it might remind you of something. Let's see if it does. Okay, so first of all, non-religious. I think that's the most obvious way in which we start. Interestingly enough, I still sometimes find myself saying secular humanism. Historically, the term humanism hasn't always necessarily referred to non-religious people. There is Christian humanism and other forms of religious humanism. Um, Humanists UK today is actually very keen not to talk about secular humanism because it thinks that humanism today just is secular humanism. Uh, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. But anyway, when we're talking about humanism in this context, yes, we are talking about secular humanism, meaning non-religious. That seems to be perhaps one of the most straightforward things about it. Um, the second thing, which is related, you might say it's just another way of saying the same thing, but perhaps it's not quite, that it's committed to what you might call a naturalistic worldview, which to put negatively means not supernatural. So we understand the world as a natural phenomenon. Its workings are explained by uh, science and you know, humanities and social sciences maybe, but that's it really. You don't explain the nature of the world through appeal to any kind of hidden supernatural forces which can't in some ways be kind of measured, tested and so forth. Third thing, um, the one life aspect. Humanists really do believe that this is the one life we have. When we're dead, that's it we're gone. And, you know, that is quite significant because there are people who would say, I'm not religious, I'm not, I don't believe in anything supernatural, but I do believe there is a sense in which we, we live on, we go on to live, and that's, that's, that's the way nature works. It's about cycles of rebirth are natural, they're not supernatural. But the humanist version of naturalism says, well, no, that's not true. As biological creatures, our death is the end, full stop. It's ethical, remember that, that mention of rights and responsibilities in one of the different definitions we saw earlier. This is very important because for humanists, uh, they've had to face the challenge ever since there have been such things, that people claim that without a God, anything is permitted, that ethics requires some kind of divine or transcendent foundation. And if you're a humanist, and you've been a humanist for some time, you'll be tired of trying to explain why that's not true. So it's very important to the humanist identity to say, yes, we have an ethics. We believe in living well and treating people properly. The commitment to reason is also a very, very central part of the humanist identity. Uh, the, the Rationalist Association is one of the other major um, humanist organisations in the UK. They use that term rationalist in their title. Uh, the Free Inquiry is, the, is a, a sort of secular humanist magazine in the United States. And by reason, people uh, think primarily they're talking about the use of the scientific method to discover the way the world works and appeal to evidence. So it's a very empirical version of reason. And this seems to be very important. There is a concern with human capacities, welfare and happiness. 
it may not be the exclusive concern. Uh, humanists today are often interested in things like animal welfare, but nonetheless, you know, the humanism is very much centered on trying to develop human capacities, trying to celebrate them, if you like, to try to show their capabilities. And they're also interested in the welfare and happiness of humans, because that is the ultimate good for uh, humanists in the sense there is nothing else that could be the ultimate good. And then there's this collection of things around autonomy, democracy, free inquiry. These are terms that were used in various definitions. And I've put them together because I think what they have in common is this idea that humanists very much believe that the individual has to think for themselves, has an, has an obligation to act for themselves, and that political systems should reflect the wishes of those free individuals in society. And the final thing, moral equality. This is a very important feature for humanists. So, uh, you know, whatever your ethnicity, whatever your religion, actually, um, secular humanists are not in favour of denying rights to people who are not humanists. It's far from it. Uh, men or women, gay, straight, whatever it might be, there's to be a moral equality amongst all people. So that's a fairly kind of, you know, that's given the three definitions we've seen of humanism, I think it's a fairly uncontroversial summary of what they mean. Now, the question, does it remind you of anything? Well, you know, what it reminds me of is, is this. It's the European Enlightenment. This is a a uh, picture, a painting of a reading of a work by Voltaire in a uh, Paris salon. I think most of these Paris salons wouldn't quite be as well attended as this. I think they tend to be a little bit more intimate. You will notice there are women in this scene. Uh, many of the great Enlightenment salons in Paris were run by women. And nonetheless, most of the participants were, were men. So it was, it's interesting because there was a kind of a nod to equality there, but it was never entirely uh, fully realized. Now, all these things that uh, we identify with humanism are exactly the kind of things that these enlightenment philosophers were in favor of. They were, well, non-religious, certainly in the traditional sense. They were a broad church. There were some deists who believed maybe there was some kind of creator God that the universe had to get going through creator. But the deists believed that that kind of deity had no interest at all in human affairs since. So, so it was a kind of an irrelevance. In practice, uh, they were living kind of like atheists because they didn't think our obligation was to satisfy, satisfy this God. I mean, this God had no interest. You know, the idea that this God would want us to worship him, if it was even a him, was, would be a ridiculous thing to, to, to say. They were interested in ethics and uh, they saw themselves having a rather enlightened ethics. Reason, of course, was absolutely um, central and their, their championing of science was really, really important. And they were human centric. They were humanists in the sense that they did believe that you know, with human reason and ingenuity, we could solve many of the major problems. Autonomy and democracy, and not all of them were perhaps Democrats in the modern sense of the word, but they certainly did believe in the individual taking responsibility for themselves, having freedom to act for themselves. In his very famous essay, uh, What is Enlightenment? Immanuel Kant said that the motto of the Enlightenment was dare to know. And that he said that this kind of, there was a state of, he called it like childhood, childishness, in which we didn't dare to know for ourselves. We just accepted uh, truth that was given to us. And it is a sign of maturity when we dare to think for ourselves and to come to our own conclusions. So there seems to be this very strong kind of overlap with European Enlightenment uh, views and the essential key ideas of humanism. And this is perhaps partly what leads to the suspicion that humanism is indeed a, a essentially a Western construct. It emerges from this Enlightenment ideals and they are very Western in their form. At the same time, you may uh, worry that that can't be quite right because a lot of these things on this list are just good things. And so the, I, it's, it can't be the case that the West doesn't own these things. If the West doesn't own these things, then uh, humanism can't be Western in that sense. 
Well, what I want to sort of try and do here is try and sort of suggest the ways in which I think the, the conception of humanism we have could indeed be something truly global, truly uh, universal. And it is pretty much as described in headline terms. However, we have to think a little bit more about what these headlines mean and how they're understood. And I think some of them perhaps are, there's too much emphasis on them, perhaps they're even a little bit mistaken. Um, but also, uh, I think some of them just simply aren't expansive enough. We've come to assume we know what they mean because we interpret them through the lens of a history of Western philosophy. And we don't recognize the fact that if we actually think, well, what might someone think of this, whose tradition is different, who comes from a different background, a different part of the world, we might find that actually we're making assumptions which are not good ones. And that to dare to think, as Kant suggested, means to dare to question assumptions we, we make about what these terms mean, what these values are. Uh, we're not daring to think if we simply parrot and repeat enlightenment values, assuming we know what they, they mean. So if you ask what is Western humanism, this is what I think some of the things that, some of the ways in which these general principles of humanisms are understood. So humanism is non-religious. This is a problematic term and I'll, I'll come to this a bit later. But I think in being non-religious, it means it's very suspicious of any kind of traditional belief systems and institutions. Um, you know, in the West, humanism was fighting the power of established religions and churches, such as the Church of England in, in the UK and the Catholic Church in, in many parts of Europe. Uh, these churches had strong authority here on earth and they often used it quite brutally and oppressively. And humanism obviously set, saw those things as enemies. But in doing so, I think it's kind of sensitized humanists to sort of not be very keen on anything that might, you know, looks remotely like a religion, a traditional belief system or institution. And I think that is potentially problematic because I think that if you look- So thanks, thanks uh, very much. Uh... Dr. Bajini, for agreeing to do this talk. Uh... In other parts of the world, there may be certain traditions of belief, which maybe in some ways you are a little bit more characteristically religious, but which humanists have things to, to learn from. A second thing about naturalism is that naturalism, to the mind of the Western humanist, is really a kind of physicalism. Now, what I mean here is that the naturalism of the Western humanist is the kind of naturalism which says science discovers the basic nature of reality. Uh, the queen of the sciences, if you like, is not philosophy anymore, it's physics. Physics describes fundamental reality. Uh, the other sciences, such as chemistry and biology, they're the special sciences that explain how sort of bits of it work at levels of higher organization. And that's really what naturalism means. Naturalism means a commitment to a scientific breaking down of the world into its fundamental uh, building blocks. Okay, And that even might sound obvious, but what I want to suggest a bit later is that that's not the only way to understand naturalism. And if we look beyond Western science, we may well see that that's not the case. Um, the idea that there's only we only have one life, I think, uh, manifests itself in a view that this, this is very clear what this means. It means death is an absolute full stop. Death is the end and no more. And if you think about it, if, if that's the way you see things, then you're going to be very suspicious of any sort of tradition of thought or culture which engages in such activities as like ancestor worship or so forth, or in, in any way kind of imagines the dead are still with us in any meaningful way. And again, what I want to suggest is that maybe that kind of uh, assumption that to believe this is the only life we have means that you know, death is this absolute full stop and the end of the story means that we might be uh, ignoring certain things which are important and useful and which humanists would do well to uh, learn from. Ethical, I think, is seen as a rational form of ethics. So, uh, of course, every tradition claims to have its ethics, religion has its ethics, but 
Well, I think humanists in the West pride themselves on their ethics of being rational. As a result, it tends to be somewhat utilitarian in nature, meaning that you know, what makes things right or wrong is their tendency to produce uh, greater happiness, greater welfare in populations, and what makes them wrong is that they decrease that. And so there's this kind of belief that to be ethical is to be rational, and it almost like these two things are the same thing. Um, Mr. Spock in Star Trek would often, um, there's one of the Star Trek films, I'm not a big Trekkie myself, I have to say, but there was that rather ridiculous and rather enjoyable one in which they try to save a whale, in which Mr. Spock says something like, you know, to hunt a species to extinction is not rational, not rational. And in a way, I think that kind of, that kind of sentiment that if you were only to be rational, you would never be unethical. Um, is a kind of assumption, I think, that's often made by uh, sort of Western humanists. There's an idea that reason itself really is the scientific method, that these things are almost coterminous with each other, that if you want to know how to be rational, then the paradigm you look for is to science, and that therefore your know, science gives us the real model. And there is a lot of kind of quite, you know, almost science worship, I would say, uh, if I'm not being too provocative, in humanist circles. Uh, Humanists UK have an annual Darwin Day lecture. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it's interesting, isn't it, that they have that Darwin Day and a Voltaire lecture, so a scientist and a philosopher. Um, and and the, the Darwin one came more, more recently, maybe? I'm not sure. But anyway, the point here is that, um, you know, science is placed on this kind of pedestal. A lot of the um, a lot of the chairs, no, not, sorry, president, a lot of the presidents of Humanist UK in recent years have been um, scientists. And um, the Humanist UK was very much campaigning a few years ago for Darwin Day to be a, a national holiday. So although it'd be a caricature to say that uh, humanists are just obsessed by science, they're also interested in other things. They have well, philosophers in particular have, have been supporters for a long time. But there is this sort of real admiration for science. So science really is the thing that's going to help us through. The emphasis on human capacities of welfare and happiness, I think, in, in Western humanism is associated with an optimism about human possibilities and human futures, and also sometimes an exceptionalism, which could be explicit or not explicit. I think that the exceptionalism is not so often held to be explicit these days. People are too aware of the fact that there is no sharp divide between humans and other animals. And that therefore, you know, if you try and sort of like claim that humans are entirely different and belong to a different realm, actually that seems to be just repeating a religious trope. You know, that God created um, the, the, all the other humans to have dominion over the other animals. But there is, I think, still a, a strong residue of that. Humans, there is an exceptionism which makes us really special and an optimism that, you know, if only we could just get over our prejudices and our supernatural thinking, we can build a, a brighter, better, if not perfect society, then a close to perfect one by using science and reason, those two things. Autonomy, democracy and free inquiry, three values. I think they get associated, and again, I think this is implicit and not explicit, with a individualism. Uh, you know, like it or not, uh, you know, it, it just is it's a kind of an, an assumption it's almost impossible not to make. That why do we value autonomy? Why do we value democracy? Why do we value free inquiry? How do you put those values into practice? It is by maximizing the capacity of the individual to act for his or herself and to think for him or herself. And by doing that, you're kind of emphasizing the, the primacy of the individual over any group. And even to say that I'm aware in, in certain Western contexts, uh, to even suggest that there might be something suspicious about that is to risk sounding like you're in favor of, I don't know, some kind of herd humanity, a kind of a stifling collectivism. And finally here, moral equality, I think is often, again, implicitly thought to assume that there, there are really no important moral distinctions to be made at all between people. So if everyone to have the same moral equality means everyone has the same rights, everyone has the same responsibilities, 
and that any kind of distinctions are in some way egregious. So I think this is just a little sketch of how I think hum the humanist ideals are understood, as I say, often implicitly by Western humanists. And what I want to suggest is that if we look beyond the West, we can see reasons why, in some ways, all of these things are sometimes not quite right and sometimes very much not right. Let's start with the non-religious aspect. If you say that humanists are non-religious, then does that mean humanism has any time for, um, respectively, from left to right, Shinto, uh, the indigenous religion of Japan, Buddhism or Confucianism. These things are all held often to be religions. So are humanists going to be thinking there's not much we can learn from these things? Interesting enough, the little book of humanism did contain a quote from Confucius, um, but actually it wasn't a quote from Confucius. It was <laughs> one of, it was one of the, the second edition will correct this. It was one of those things that is often attributed to Confucius and it's not something he said at all. Um, but let's, let's take these in reverse order. Confucianism actually is not a religion, absolutely not a religion. And I think that this is just a question where, uh, uh, this is just a case where a simple misconception can lead people to be blind to the resources of these things. Confucianism is often thought of a religion because you know, it, people kind of assume that every culture has its religion and that if, you know, this is what the Jesuits who went to China thought. They arrived in China, they came across this uh, system of belief, this thought system, which had a name, which actually in Chinese, the name does, it's not called Confucianism, it's called something like, a, you know, scholarly, the, the, the school of scholars or something like this. It doesn't mention any Confucianism. Well, they thought, aha, well, you know, that's the Chinese version of religion. And because we name our religion after our founder, they named it after that. So they, they called it Confucianism. I think it's really important to recognize that Confucianism absolutely is not a religion. It's a secular philosophy. Um, do not be mis misled by a few phrases such as the way of heaven. The phrase the way of heaven is, is kind of really only talking about the, the, the order of nature. To follow the way of nature is to, to, to follow the way of heaven is simply to follow the, the natural order of things. There isn't any uh, thing here about um, afterlife and so forth. And so certainly, you know, one should be able to Confucianism as a humanist resource. And we'll say more about that later. What about something like Buddhism? I mean, Buddhism is a, always an interesting test case when people are trying to have arguments which about you know, what is or what isn't a religion. And there are people who, there are Buddhists themselves who are very, very keen to say Buddhism is not a religion, it's a philosophy. Um, look, to give the short answer, my, without, I can't give the full argument for it here. Buddhism is extremely diverse and it has many different forms and many aspects of many forms of Buddhism are highly religious indeed. Uh, prayer wheels, incantations, all that kind of thing. But Buddhism is also something which is a very, very rich philosophical tradition. And many Buddhist texts and teachings are of profound interest to people who, are, who hold what we might call humanist values. So again, if you are to assume that humanism means non-religious, you may well be cutting yourself off from the resources of Buddhism. What about the, the final example of Shinto in, in Japan? Well, Shinto is a, is a fascinating uh, religion, I have to say, in some ways very attractive, in other ways totally unattractive and quite bizarre from a Western point of view. Um, it is an entirely nationalistic religion. You know, it is all about Japan and Japan being different, which makes it very, very strange. But when you see Shinto shrines in Japan, and this is one in Tokyo, I believe, and you see people coming to do the rites there, what you kind of recognize is it seems very unlikely to me that all these people coming there believe that within this shrine there is a karma, there is a, there is a literal spirit who should be pleased with an offering. Rather, what people are doing is they are participating in a kind of form of life and a set of rituals which give a sense of identity, history and cohesion. And certain values which Shinto upholds are values that you can uphold without any belief in anything supernatural whatsoever. 
And so I suppose the point here is that I think that in, from the Western mindset, which sees humanism as most definitely not religious, it's doing so from a point of view where to, to, to humanists in a country like the UK or America, religion is prototypically uh, Christianity or Islam, where there is very often a, a strong emphasis on belief, on creed and so forth. And they also have a lot of secular authority and that's what we're rebelling against. But if you look at the family of you know, what counts as religion around the world, I think there are many uh, religions and uh, religious traditions which are very much hybrid in which it, it depends exactly where you are and who you are and what time you are, how much you have to buy into things that humanists don't like. Now, given these examples of um, uh, systems from, from Asia, which I'm more familiar with, but I, I would just like to flag up, I'm sure this would be true also when approaching uh, belief systems of you know, indigenous peoples in South America, Australia, New Zealand, also uh, parts of Africa, the kind of what are called uh, folk religions. Uh, superficially, they're going to look like the kind of thing humanists should have no time for whatsoever. But I think we should be careful about that because things are more complicated than they seem. And often a, a lot of the function of what we call religions is to bring shape and form to community life and to express certain values. And the supernatural elements are not always important as we might think and sometimes not important at all. So that's the, 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 the non-religious thing, maybe something we don't, not want to make too much of. In fact, I do think it's very difficult actually to talk about religion and non-religion because the boundaries are so hard to define. William James, well, yeah, again, it's a good pub conversation. What distinguishes a religion from a non-religion? What, and then coming up with exceptions to it. William James has a pretty good definition. The life of religion consists of the belief that there is an unseen order and that our supreme good lies in harmoniously adjusting ourselves there too. That's his definition of religion. But interestingly enough, you know, if you think, if that's what religion is, you know, science could be a person's religion because, you know, science is about uncovering unseen order. That's what makes it so amazing. You know, when you read about discoveries in fundamental physics, I mean, we're absolutely uncovering things about an unseen order. And the idea that you have to, I mean, not many people think the idea is to align our, our lives to the underlying order in the sense of, of, of how physics may be. But again, other people have done that with science. Uh, the way in which evolutionary theory was distorted by many people, I think, was that people thought that they had their scientific view of the world, evolution, and social Darwinism was the kind of view that therefore we ought to align ourselves to that. We ought to live in ways that promote the survival of the fittest and so forth. So, you know, you can see here that if you're going to define, I think pretty much any definition of religion is gonna probably either not catch things which we very much think are religious, or they're going to include things which we suspect aren't. So in a way, I think what I'm really suggesting is that maybe, maybe it's not too helpful to, to be too focused on defining humanism as not religious. Because although in the Western context where you know, Christianity is the most dominant, that's a useful distinction. When you start looking at the plurality of religions about the world, maybe it isn't. Which would lead us to the second kind of distinction, which perhaps is more hope, hopeful which is the distinction between naturalism as opposed to any kind of supernaturalism. Now, again, this is a, a difficult distinction to make with absolute rigor, but I think there's definitely something to it. But the point here is to understand that if we embrace naturalism and we reject supernaturalism, we've got to be very careful to not assume we know what that means. I said earlier, I felt that naturalism for lots of Western humanists really means a commitment to a kind of scientific physicalism. The idea that the way to understand the world is to, to break it down into its smallest parts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, again, I'm taking examples from East Asia because they're the ones I'm most familiar with. But here we have um, the, the great wave, the uh, most famous painting, Hokusai, I think, was it, wasn't it? sure it's Hokusai, the great wave and and the on the right we have a Chinese um, nature painting. Nature is the primary subject of art both in Japan and in China and in both those cases what you tend to find if you look carefully 
you see the human lives there too. A lot of people, when they look at the Great Rave, it takes them a long time to notice there are actually two boats being caught up in the sea there. We're so transfixed by the waves, you don't hardly notice the boats. Similarly, that landscape painting, the Chinese landscape painting, there are little houses and little pagodas there. And, and, and the, this is typical of, of all sorts of nature painting in China and Japan, that the human is there as a small part of the greater whole, but it is a part, and that's kind of the point. Um, there's an understanding of a human's human life as being a part of nature, not apart from nature, to use that rather slightly cheesy um, distinction. But in making that distinction, you know, nature is something which is a, a dynamic, it's alive, it's, it's, we are deeply embedded in it. It is not something that we can simply kind of uh, almost detach ourselves from and, 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 and approach with a complete objectivity in which we kind of make ourselves separate from it. And I think that, you know, maybe I'm not expressing myself as clearly as, as I could. Maybe it's because I'm not quite sure what I'm trying to express. But I think you can see how if we embrace naturalism, it leaves open huge questions about what that kind of naturalism means and that it certainly doesn't mean uh, or doesn't only mean uh, looking at the world through a scientific lens. Now again I think if you look beyond East Asia again you look to places like Africa, South America and so forth and you look at the tra more traditional philosophical systems there I think a lot of them are I mean, most of them, it is true, do have certain beliefs in spirits, souls, whatever else it might be. There's also a very strong current of a, a kind of a naturalism. These things aren't, the, people believe in spirits and souls, but they don't see them as being something apart from nature. They see them as being deeply embedded in nature. And so that leaves open the question that maybe these ways of understanding, maybe we would object to the ways in which people talk of spirit, souls, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe there are important truths being captured there, which we can really learn from. Uh, when people talk, for example, about you know, belonging to the earth, and they talk about the earth as, as a mother, uh, is there not a way in which that's entirely true? And the ways in which it might sound somewhat supernatural are actually almost more like uh, metaphorical. So in thinking about naturalism, if humanists are naturalists, then I think we need to be alert to the ways in which other ways of thought around the world describe and articulate our relationship to nature in ways that might be a little bit richer and, and more complicated and put us more in the picture than the, than the scientific view, which in a way separates us from nature. And it is interesting, I think, that um, this highly scientific view of nature has left us so unable to explain the fundamental things about our own nature. I mean, humanists in the West happily talk about the importance of science and reason, and also talk about the importance of humanity and so forth. And yet, it has, at the same time, having to acknowledge the fact that from a scientific point of view, it seems utterly baffling and mysterious how we can even have consciousness and love and emotion and all these things. One life. I said earlier that I felt that uh, the, the, the humanist view that we have only one life and, and that's all we live kind of assumes that death is this absolute full stop. And that therefore, when you look at other cultures in which people talk about the dead as being somehow present with us, that this is a sign not to pay attention to those traditions. And the first picture here is of uh, an ancestor uh, worship ceremony, I think a Chinese one, the kind of things that would be laid out in front of it. And we think this sort of ancestor worship betrays a kind of a outdated and uh, unscientific view of the world in which people assume the dead live on. Um, I kind of think there's some other ways to understand this, and I think which could be helpful ways to understand it. The other pictures I've got here are simply illustrations of the fact that I, I think if you're an anthropologist from Mars and you were to spend um, just an afternoon wandering around anywhere, a city like Bristol where I live, you'd probably conclude that the people here worship their ancestors. 
because it's filled, it's filled with memorials to them. Park benches have the names of the dead on them. Virtually every park bench has the names of at least one dead on them. We erect statues to people, plaques, whatever it might be. We name streets, buildings, and so forth. Um, now you might say, yes, but okay, that's not ancestor worship, because we don't believe that by doing this, we're in any kind of communion with them or that they can appreciate it. Well, okay, sure, but then, then why do we do it? Why on earth do we do these things? Why put a plaque on a bench to a dead person when that dead person can't say, that's very nice, thank you. I'm glad you remember me. I think that there is a sense in which the connection we have to the dead and the ways in which the dead sort of live on in our hearts and minds and so forth is a fundamental part of the human experience. And that therefore, I think that if we're going to, you know, in a sense, that to just sort of say we have to be grown up and scientific and death is death and that is the end, we might be missing something quite important. So again, I don't have any sort of like great answers to this about what we might learn, but I, I think we should be uh, willing to approach other ways of thought, non-Western ways of thought in which the roles of ancestors are more highlighted and seek to try to understand from them because I think this is really important, you know, humanist funerals are one of the big growth areas in humanism. It's one of the things that's bringing people to humanism. And, you know, humanist funerals are all about trying to sort of celebrate that connection. And in a way, are they not trying to keep something of the dead person alive in one way? A humanist celebrant doesn't say, well, look, they're gone, just get over it. <laughs> Flippant, maybe. So, so I think we ought to think a little bit about that too, not just dismiss non-Western ways of thought in which uh, ancestors have a more important role. I should probably speed up because I'm being a bit slow, but um, at the same time, I don't want to overspeed. Another point is that the reason is said to is thought to be the same as science and logic, essentially. That's what reason is in the Western humanist view. And here I just think we have a massively, massively uh, diminished conception of what reason is and this is where I think we just get it wrong actually in other and some of the other things I've talked about I've been suggesting there's a sort of you know perhaps things we're missing a little bit of wrong emphasis I think the idea that reason is essentially exhausted by science and logic is is completely mistaken um, I've written about this in a book called the edge of reason at, at some length um, essentially uh, to, to, to be rational to use reason which I think of the, they mean essentially the same thing is to use any mode of thought in which you are essentially offering reasons for what you are asserting, reasons for what you believe, rather than simply asserting them or asking them to be taken on the basis of trust or tradition. And I think we have all sorts of ways of reasoning which are not science and not logic. I think often when you go and see a film or read a great book, you are in an important sense engaged in a form of reasoning. You're being presented with stories, scenarios, thoughts, pieces of dialogue, which give you reason to change your conception of the world. And so, for example, we have here, and I think that because, because we identify reason so much with the kind of formal propositions of logic and academic philosophy and science, Western humanism is in danger of missing all the reason that is found elsewhere. So I've just got three examples here. Uh, Basho, the Japanese poet, he wrote uh, haikus and short poems and also a very uh, interesting, lovely sort of poetic travelogue, actually. Um, now, I think that if you read Basho, uh, and looking, you know, looking for a philosopher, looking for someone who's giving us reasons to change our mind, reasons to understand the world differently, you find one there. And the fact that it's not a scientific treatise, there's not a systematic philosophy, is, uh, is, is not the point. The Tao Te Ching, that's what the central um, image is of. The Tao Te Ching, pick it up casually as someone steeped in, in Western thought, and you say, oh, well, it's just a load of sayings and aphorisms, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't, if you study it with care, and you read it in the right spirit, you find things to, to learn from. And the last uh, example here is a very famous book by Henry Okuruka, uh, which was about this idea of sage philosophy. So the idea he had was that in many parts of Africa, there is of course written philosophy in Africa, 
particularly uh, Ethiopia. Ethiopia, uh, not all of it survives, but there's a lot of written philosophy in Ethiopia and other parts of Africa. But having said that, a lot, in a lot of uh, Africa, the way in which ideas have been preserved has been through oral tradition. And the same is true in lots of places such as you know, the Aboriginal peoples of Australia, the Maori in New Zealand and so forth. And again, this kind of thinking is not presented as science, it's not presented as systematic philosophy, and it's often therefore dismissed. It's not reason, it's just folk belief. And Aruka felt that if, if, if you could go and interview, talk, he basically conducted discussions with the wisest people in particular communities, people had a particular reputation for it. And he found that some of them, some of them actually, they were just repeating old wisdom, you know, regurgitating it. He didn't consider these people to be sages, sage philosophers. But others, he thought they were, they were sage philosophers. They were not just repeating and regurgitating. They had different takes, they had insight on these things. And they were, so they were both preserving, but also developing traditions of thought. And the idea that within all traditions, we have deep resources that people who are daring to know, as Kant said, should have an interest in is something that has really escaped a lot of uh, Western philosophy and in, in turn Western humanism. So I, I, on, on this case, I think that when we create reason with science and logic, we're missing um, so much. And again, we're missing so much from different traditions of thought out, out of the West, which don't look like philosophy as we know it in the West. They don't look like science. And therefore the humanist thinks there's nothing to be gained from them. That I think is a huge mistake. The idea that ethics is essentially rational, that this, this rational approach to life should extend to ethics, I think is perhaps one of the biggest red herrings of them all. This is David Hume, a, an Enlightenment hero, a humanist hero. One of his most famous sentences, reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. Well, actually Hume's most memorable lines uh, almost invariably slightly over the top. And if you read them in isolation, um, might sound a bit misleading. But what he meant here is, is, is really clear. The basis of ethics is not reason. It's as simple as that. Mr. Spock could never be ethical because Mr. Spock, if, well, he's actually, now I'm getting into trekology. Um, a Spock in the sense of a person who had only reason and did not have feeling could never be ethical because they lack the motivation to be ethical. In other words, you see somebody suffering, you want to alleviate their suffering. There is no logical reason to, to reduce their suffering. Logic doesn't tell you that their suffering is bad. The facts tell you this person doesn't like their suffering. The facts tell you this person would rather not be suffering. But that doesn't tell you you ought to prevent it or you ought to do something to stop it. What Hume thought, along with people like Adam Smith, was that actually what drives us, or fundamentally motivates us ethically, is sentiment, moral sentiment and feeling. It's that compassion to, to feel the suffering of the other in some respect and to recognize it as bad and recognize it as something that you would want to alleviate. That's not reason. Reason's role in ethics is to help us to, uh, partly instrumental to try and help us to find the best means to achieve those goals, but also to try and, and this is where I think Hume's quote is misleading, it's not quite the slave of the passions, is to unpick some of those feelings because actually emotion and reason are not entirely separate things. A lot of the time people have an emotional reaction because of a mistaken belief and their emotions change when their uh, uh, rational beliefs change. So if you think about it, so let's take one of the most terrible examples in history, um, slavery. So if you, I mean, there are many forms of slavery and of course there was, there was black slavery with black slave owners. But if you think about the, the slave trade, the European slave trade, the American slave trade, part of what made that possible was a belief, a belief by white slave traders that in some sense, the people who they were trading were not fully human. In fact, Hume didn't go as far as they weren't fully human, but he believed there was this sort of superiority of some races over the others. 
so for all his brilliance as a philosopher, Hume got some things horribly, horribly wrong. And this is what he got horribly, horribly wrong. When you understand that there is no uh, racial superiority, your feelings towards uh, slaves change. You, you, can't, you can no longer have that view. And, and in the same kind of way that as our understanding of animal cognition and animal sentience changes, it becomes our feelings change. When you, if you believe that an animal can't really suffer, then it doesn't bother you to do things in which it cries out in pain. When you have reason to believe that it does, then your feelings change. But the point here is this, that whatever you want to look at this, it's simply not the case that it's reason which drives ethics full stop. We want to be rational in our ethical decision making, that is true, but you can't base your ethics in reason alone. And again, if you look at non-Western belief systems, philosophies, and so forth, I think if you understand ethics as ways in which human beings have tried to come to understandings about how to negotiate their responsibilities to each other and how to treat each other, then it would be remarkable, it would be in fact to be ridiculous to believe that that had only really happened in a rational way in the West. Um, people have come up with their moral principles in other parts of the world, often for good reasons, because they have found that this is what is conducive to their flourishing, to the flourishing of their societies and so forth. Of course, there are mistaken ethical views which are based on false theological premises, essentially. I think almost all bad ethics, well, it's not true. Uh, let me rephrase that. A vast proportion of bad ethics uh, derives it, itself from the fact that there is a theological dogma which then generates ridiculous uh, views. And sometimes the ridiculous views are there only to reinforce group identity, for example. So a lot of rules about ritual and eating, they serve no purpose other than to give uh, the faithful something to do which distinguishes them and to prove their, their faithfulness. But that's certainly not what all non-Western ethics is like. And I think, again, we need to sort of like, uh, when we're looking at other ethical traditions, look at Confucianism and so forth, the fact that you don't see rational arguments being presented to defend these principles doesn't mean that it has nothing to tell us about ethics at all. And in fact, I think there's a heck of a lot to learn from uh, non-Western ethics. Again, I know more perhaps about the the East Asian ones, but um, I'll come to another example, which is from elsewhere later. I want to speed up a bit. So I've been talking for nearly an hour, which is very exhausting online. So thank you very much if you're still here. Um, human exceptionalism is a real problem. And again, I think th this, this goes back to the idea of naturalism. So I think that in many non-Western ways of thinking, the naturalistic worldview is more naturalistic than, than the Western one, because it never allows human beings to be entirely distinguished from the rest of, na rest of nature. So the, I can't pronounce this one, the Wanganui, the Wanganui River in New Zealand, apologies for any mispronunciation. You may have heard about this, it was granted the legal status of a person in New Zealand law a few years ago um, in respect of the beliefs of Maoris. Uluru in Australia, uh, which for many years we called Ayers Rock in the way in which we typically uh, named things after their uh, Western discoverers, um, again has a sacred sort of status for uh, the indigenous people of the area. And I think what both these things show is that, you know, a way of understanding human beings in which we are deeply connected to all our environment, the land, the other animals, the whole shebang. And that really, particularly as we're facing the ecological crisis we're facing, the idea that there's not some wisdom in that that we ought to learn from, I think is absurd. I should just say at this point, by the way, that I'm, I'm not one of these sort of, um, I'm neither a West basher nor a, 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 a you know, a, a, a non-Western idealizer. There, there can be a tendency to kind of romanticize uh, non-Western thought as like, ah, oh, you know, the West has got it all wrong and has gone astray. And in other parts of the world, people have, I don't know, have a more intuitive wisdom. It's not like that. I actually believe that there's loads which is great in Western thought, but I just don't think we have a monopoly on it. It's as simple as that. And there's lots to learn from elsewhere. Autonomy and democracy racing through. 
And again, all I said earlier was I felt that in, this is often understood to be a very individualistic thing. And I think, again, this is really, really um, problematic because one of the things that distinguishes the West from the modern West, from all uh, other parts of the world and most part, and the West in its past as well, is that most of human society has understood as, as profoundly social animals and it's our relations to others which are absolutely primary. You can't even think about what it means to be a human without thinking about your relations to others. But somehow the Western individualism has been pushed to such an extent that the individual, the atom, the atomistic individual has become the fundamental unit and the relations are entirely secondary. I think this is, this is a mistake. The, the value of Ubuntu, um, there are many ways to um, describe it, but it's, 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 it, essentially it has the idea that of the interdependence of our being upon each other. That you know, I I am you and you and me is is one way of putting it. That you know, that we 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 only exist in relation to each other, and and this has profound importance for how we understand ethics and politics. In the Ubuntu conception of our interdependence means that you can never have a kind of democracy in which the majority wins and the minority just have to put up with it. You have to have a system in which somehow one, we come to a collective uh, consensus a consensus which everyone's happy with. Interestingly enough, the Durban climate change talks, which I think were in the late 1990s, uh, that many people have said that it was their use of Ubuntu principles in some of the negotiation which led to some of, of the success there. Um, that's more than just a kind of a, a, a bit of, um, what is it? it's not an urban myth, that. that's something which has explicitly been said by people involved in it. So again, I just think that when we, the, the, the strong emphasis that Western humanists tend to put on the individual, I think he's denying something really, really important about how we exist only in relation to others. And the idea finally on this list that equality means no moral distinctions. I think this is, this is another potential worry. Uh, this is a, a text, the Canon of Filial Piety, a, a Chinese classic. Um, in Confucian ethics, Every, your, your, what, what your obligations are and what your rights are depend upon your place in the society, and particularly in the family, whether your mother, father, son, daughter, etc., etc. Now, exactly how that plays out is not something we'd want to endorse today. It's patriarchal and very hierarchical. But there is a, a fundamental notion there, which I think is important, which is that how we relate to each other, we do, we, our obligations do depend on who we are and who we stand in relation to. And again, I think this is something that almost every philosophical system acknowledges and understands around the world. The idea that, you know, to be ethical and equality actually means making no distinctions at all between people, treating them exactly the same, is actually a very a strange Western thing. Now, in certain contexts, it's absolutely important that we do that, but is it important in all contexts? And I also think it helps to think about this because people often complain in that kind of weary sort of post-imperialist way that the problem with lots of these countries which used to be part of western empires is that they're so tribal and they're corrupt and it's all about clan etc etc now i have no doubt at all that um sometimes those things are problems but to see them purely as problems is to is to ignore the fact that actually um, to have ties to family, clan, community, tribe, and so forth, and to prefer um, relations, to prioritise relations with some people over others, is not an aberration. It's just a simple reflection of the fact that actually nobody uh, treats everybody else in the world as counting for one and no more than one. Any parent who treated their own child no different to how they treated a different child would not be a good parent. You have to give special care to them. Your significant other, if you have a significant other, then you know you, you regard them differently, you have different obligations and so forth. So I think I think again the idea of equality has become too easily assumed to involve an absolute sort of refusal to make distinctions. And I think that's something that um, somehow can, can make us reluctant to take non-Western uh, philosophical systems seriously because they do take these things seriously, but it also stops us learning from them. So let us conclude 
And like, I like, well, I want to just sort of emphasize the fact here that I'm really thinking I'm giving a list of pointers here rather than any kind of final set of solutions. But I think that if you look at what humanism stands for, what it's supposed to stand for, and then you question certain Western assumptions which might be underlying them, and you look at what other ways of thinking around the world might have to say, I think you can come back to those principles and you can keep most of them, but with certain revision. So don't worry about religion, non-religion, it's perhaps not a very helpful distinction. Humanism is non-theistic for sure. A humanist does not believe in a God who has to be obeyed and followed. It is naturalist, absolutely it's naturalist, but naturalism isn't the same as that kind of scientific reductionism. It's ethical, but if we're thinking about how to be ethical, then we need to think about how many different societies and traditions of thought have understood that and be prepared to learn from them and not assume that the only way to be ethical is somehow to kind of follow some kind of rational algorithm. In terms of, we have to be questioning, reasoning, thinking and inquiring. These are very, very important humanist values, but we must not assume that that is the same as science and logic. These are much broader values than that. And we, we impoverish our toolkit of questioning, reasoning, thinking, and inquiring if we only use the tools of logic and science. I don't think humanism should be anthropocentric in the sense that we have to be aware that we're just a small part of this. Uh, yeah, the naturalistic worldview entails that human beings are just a part of nature uh, like any other, and that the, there are going to be huge similarities and overlaps between us and other animals. So we should never be too anthropocentric. There should be a pluralist commitment to flourishing. So um, rather than this kind of the idea that human welfare counts, of course it does, and we need to promote it. But there's more than one way to flourish. And in different societies, in different times, flourishing can mean different things. Um, the autonomy of reason can be overstated. I, my slogan is, is you should think for yourself, but not by yourself. We shouldn't be so keen on the idea that you have to think for yourself that we forget the fact that we actually reason better when we reason together. And in fact, that's something that um, theory of social co cognition in contemporary psychology suggests is true, that actually you get people reasoning together, they do it better than reasoning alone. Uh, and the, the Western idea of the solitary individual uh, working in their study is actually highly misleading. There can be a quality without sameness that to, to value equality is really, really important, but that does not mean that everyone should be treated exactly the same way. I'm aware of the fact that that's often used as an excuse for discrimination, et cetera, et cetera, but it needn't be. And finally, we need this non-atomistic conception of personhood. I think this is one of the most fundamental things. We've kind of sleepwalked. We, we're not, we haven't noticed the extent to which our conception of the individual is quite extreme and quite different to that that has been held in most part times of history and around the world. We've come to see the self as being far more atomistic than it really is. And that when we look at other philosophies and ways of thinking around the world, we find they all acknowledge the relationality of selfhood and personhood. And I think that's something we really need to learn as well. That I believe is the end of my probably slightly too long presentation. I'll be happy to take um, questions and objections and virtual bricks. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Virginie. That was beyond excellent, beyond wonderful. Um, I think if you don't mind, you know, we could have just a short break, five mm -hmm. minutes perhaps, just so that uh, people can maybe have a chance to digest some of it and to um, perhaps uh, write any questions they may have because we're going to ask people to mm. we're going to ask people to say their own questions but uh, we want to know who has got a question so how are we going to know that so stick something in the text in the in the chat and then we'll let us know that you want to ask a question and then we'll 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 put the, we'll ask then we can select people to ask questions i hope that is clear i hope everybody understood what i said so if you don't mind, we'll just have a short five minutes and then we'll come back and start on the question. Great, thanks Clive.
we'll just give it one more minute and <clears throat> if you have a question you can also use your raise hands function like this That's actually a clap, Clive, but I mean... Clap. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it doesn't really matter, really, because, yeah. Right, under, yeah. Reaction, under the reactions button, isn't it? Under reactions, you can you can also show your crying with laughter if, if, huh. if that happens. Or All far. right. Anyway, the, it, there's a, the reactions. Yeah, that's it. Reactions, and then raise, raise hand or lower hand. And uh, then your, you, you will come to the top of the list, and I can ask you to ask a question. How's that? <laughs> okay. Great. Okay. So we're about to start. So um, here we go. I'll ask Jacob Jacob Brown F to kick us off, please. You have a question, Jacob. You might have to unmute yourself. He doesn't look muted. Yeah, he's oh, look, you you look unmuted. There you are. Okay. Okay. Uh, I I have a friend who says that Western science is racist, racist and xenophobic because it does not include indigenous ways of knowing, like shamanism. She says non-empirical ways of knowing should count as equal to empirical ways of knowing. This would be like saying that the theory of evolution is equal to an indigenous creation myth, would humanism be better or worse with a change like this? Okay, um, th thanks, thanks for the question. I mean, I think this, this, this to, I said uh, as a little aside during the talk that, you know, there are, there are certain people who kind of, you know, just sort of want to just almost like blame Western thought for all the, evils of the world and kind of want to renounce it all and I don't think I don't think that's true I think that there are lots of um, things that have been huge stains on western thought and things it's missed out but I think to kind of say that it's a racist and xenophobic because it the science western science is racist and xenophobic for excluding these things I think is um I, I just don't I don't I don't I just don't see that because I mean science <laughs> science has to be something right and science has to be empirical that's what science is now i think the the problem is not from excluding these things from science um it's by kind of assuming a priori that that there's nothing going on here that we could potentially learn from it may not be a scientist to do that it's not it's not and, and i think the other thing about respect is sorry i think the part of the respect is that People think the respect means that whatever someone says, you just say, okay, well, you know, that's, that's great. That's equally valid to me. But, you know, it, not all things are equally true, right? I want to find out what's, if I'm gonna say certain things are wrong about Western thinking, then I uh, assume there are also things that are wrong about non-Western thinking. So respect is about engaging with these ways of thinking in a way which is not dismissive and which asks what can be learned from them. Now, when it comes to creation myths, and I, I don't know, really. I mean, it was an interesting anthropological question. I mean, how many people believe their creation myths as to be historical truth? Um, and, I, and I don't think any of them are, right? But are there, are there insights in these things? I saw a very interesting film the other day, which was about an old, not a creation myth, but an old myth in, in I think, Inuit culture about um, the mother of the sea, it was called. You Google it, it's a very short animated film. It's really, it's really good. Um, and, you know, it's a myth, but it, but it contains certain ideas about, you know, how, how we are uh, related to the sea and, and have to look after it in order for us to get our food from it, which are, which are important. Shamanism is something which I know very, very little about. And, you know, I have to 
confess to you that with my background, I kind of hear that word and I immediately start thinking, oh, you know, but, you know, um, I think people who've looked at shamanism more seriously would say that, you know, again, there are potentially things in it which, uh, you know, are capturing certain truths. So I, I think that to sort of believe that, to sort of say that you don't think that a creation myth has the empirical validity of a scientific view of the origins of nature is not racist or xenophobic. What would be racist or xenophobic was to be to say, uh, in any society which spouts such things is clearly so primitive and unintellectual that there'd be even nothing to learn from it at all. So I think that would be my response to that. Okay, thank you very much. Right. Um, now, I'll just <clears throat> like to ask Jeremy, Jeremy Rodell, to ask his question, please. Thanks, Clive, and thanks, Julian, for a very interesting talk. Uh, I'm just going to start by challenging you on something. I, I think uh, you were a little harsh, uh, and perhaps understandably, in caricaturing you know, what Humanist UK says about humanism. Um, because it you know it, it's not doesn't promote scientism, and uh, it, you know its slogan front page of its website says "Think for yourself, act for everybody," you know which is about community, and it's a big a lot of emphasis on kindness and uh, and these things as well. So I so but I can see why that was a useful thing to do because it pointed out some very other interesting, very interesting points. I suppose my, my question was really goes back to Clive's question at the beginning, which was that there is an issue here about perception of humanism. And um, which is a shame because it, it closes things down and, and means that as a humanist, I probably don't encounter a lot of really interesting people that I ought to. That's looking at it very selfishly. How do we get past that perception issue? Yeah. Good question. On the first point, actually, I don't think I was having a go at Humanist UK because I don't, I don't think I accused it of being scientific. I did, I did point out that there's a lot of science foregrounded in its communications, which is true. But absolutely, you no, know, Humanist UK doesn't sort of a, adopt a, a, a kind of highly reductionist sort of view, etc. But how do we get over that perception? Well, I think, okay, I love, Jer Jeremy is a, a humanist UK, um, uh, very, very involved with them. So you, you may have an answer to this yourself, but when you say mis misconception, I suppose that one always has to sort of like be honest with oneself and say, is a misconception or well, is it just a misconception or is there some truth in the conception? Yeah, you're right. So, 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 so to make it clear that I'm not accusing, right? I'm, I'm, my discipline is philosophy. Now, if people were to say that Anglophone philosophy has a problem with um, non-Western ways of thinking and it has a problem with representation of women, let alone, let alone you know, white women, <laughs> um, then you, you can only address that by saying it does, because it has, and it's working on it, but it's not getting there. Now, with the, so the first question is, is it the case? And actually, has anyone got any, if someone has got an empirical answer, I'd like to know this. What are the kind of ethnic minority representation in Humanist UK and other European and American um, humanist organisations? Is it... Um, proportionate to their uh, proportion of the populations. I mean, do, do you know anything about that, Jeremy? Or does anyone know? know yeah, that? it is roughly, you know, because it's, I mean, that's one of the other problems is 95, if you take the UK, 95% of the non-religious people uh, non-identifying in the UK are, are white. Mm. Right. And Humanist UK does reflect that, and actually its board is probably slightly non-representative because it's got uh, more ethnic you know, minority people on it than the average. But that, in a way, it's self-fulfilling, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So there is the, 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 there must be reasons why, um, as it turns out, that humanism and, and non-belief is 
something which is more white than non-white, okay, in, in this country, right? Um, so one has to sort of acknowledge from that. And so in a sense, if you're trying to kind of reach out and you're trying to expand the membership and to be inclusive, then one's got to recognize what the obstacles are. And, it, and I say, it's, it's not necessarily it's anyone's fault <laughs> that this has happened. This may reflect societal things. But it therefore means you have to make positive changes. Yeah. So for example, to get a comparison with the philosophy again, in philosophy, there is still lack of represent, there's, there's not enough representation of women. Now I, what, I have a, a side job, it's not a full-time job as, as academic director of the Royal Institute of Philosophy. And in my programming, since I've started, because I'm responsible for the events, I am looking for diversity in terms of philosophical traditions, ethnicity, race, etc. And I'm looking for 50-50 male, female. Now that 50-50 male, female is not accurately representing the profession at the moment, actually, you know, because it isn't at that stage. But it's kind of like, because that's where we need to go to, we need to kind of take the active um, steps. I think that some people are against this kind of thing. I, I'm, I'm not. So, 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 so my view is that, you know, humanism has to recognise it has a challenge that for historical reasons, it hasn't been as appealing to uh, non-white people as to white people so far. As far as to be a universal thing, there's no reason why it should a priori. And so it has to kind of take those steps. And I think you usually say with the board, the board is actually more mixed than the membership. I think that's right. I think you have to kind of like do these things because to, to send those signals. The other thing is about finding ways to engage. And, you know, you've got an association of, of black humanists, which is great, you know, and, you know, hopefully, apart from just being really pleased that it exists and pleased that it's itself a way of, a, 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 you know, perhaps a more, uh, I don't know, welcoming, well, welcoming is one way to say, I'm sure they're welcoming everywhere, but I don't know, a more accessible space for people to come to it. I would hope that the Humanist UK would be trying to talk to them about, you know, what do, what do they think? I mean, we've got people here, it'd be interesting, we could, this could turn out with a discussion. What do they think of the obstacles to this? Why is it that the membership isn't as diverse as the population is? So there's no simple answer, but you've got to, you've got to, one's got to recognise that there is a problem and one's got to work, take active steps to do it and recognise the fact that simply, simply saying we're open to all and we're whatever isn't going to be enough, you know. And by the way, I don't know what Humanist UK is doing about this. For all I know, they're doing all the right things already. I very much admire uh, the leadership of Humanist UK. I think Andrew Copson is terrific. So uh, don't, don't take this as, as, as assuming that I think you're not doing what you should be doing. You could well be doing everything you should be doing. But you asked me what I thought you should be doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, that's a very, very good answer. Thank you. And uh, by the way, just should say that Humanist UK can't take credit for the Association of Black Humanists. I mean, it's down to Clive and Lola and Audrey, mm. and they've done a fantastic job on that. Yeah. We should recognize that. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. That's very kind of you to say that. Um, now, and also for a great question, I'd just like to ask Bob Reuter to ask the next question, please. Thank you very much. Bob from Luxembourg, Hi, Bob. actually. Oh. Um, I feel that parts of your points of criticism of what I would call traditional humanism have actually been addressed by other people uh, in the tradition of evolutionary humanism, like by Michel schmidt salomon from Germany. Uh, first question, maybe, are you aware of this and what's your take on this? Well, no, I'm not. I mean, I, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'm not deeply steeped in that kind of kind of thing. But I mean, please do type. Please type into the chat um, references to that, um, because as I say, I very much saw this as as raising a set of um, opportunities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you think that there are people who have already basically addressed all the things that I've said in a good way, then it'd be good to know about them. And I think other people would like to know too. So do, do put into the chat um, who you're talking about. He, where, he, probably where, has where. Not, he probably has not addressed every criticism. Yeah, but, okay. and, and I fear the book is in German, so. Ah, okay. <laughs> what a shame. You're going to translate it for us? Maybe. 
Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bob. Um, now, I'd just like to ask our own Audrey from ABH, President of Black Minutes, to ask the next question, please. Thank you, Clive. Um, my question is, and we were just we were just discussing about um, how to get black people or how to get people of color or to how to diversify humanism. And I think one of the problems I faced is coming into the humanist world, and I am not a philosopher, but the philosophers that are presented, Voltaire, Kant, when I looked into them a little bit deeper, they mm. have a very anti-African, almost denigrating African people. And it's very hard then to, to kind of promote humanism to an African people when the people that are revered within that philosophy are ones that denigrate them. There mm. are African um, think free thinkers, African thinkers. Um, I'm particularly thinking of Anton William Amo, but there were others, and I can't, they don't spring to mind at the moment, he's around in the sort of 1700s, who are thinkers, who are, do you know what I mean? And it would be a way, do you think that what we should be doing is actually really promoting those free thinkers from way back when? Because we're looking at Voltaire, there were other people around, and really Humanist UK can really look at who those um, philosophers are and present those philosophies as, as alongside, because what we have is philosophies that come from the West, and they are as if, and we don't actually, we've already got African thinkers there, and we don't promote them at all. So is that something you think could be done? Yeah, no, I think you're, 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 you're dead right about that. And yeah, I mean, it's, I, I mentioned Hume earlier. I mean, I think this is very complicated in the sense that I I I I think we still have lots of reasons to mm. to admire these people despite the fact that they had these awful blind spots. Um, but you're right. If they're the only people being put forward, or they're being people all the time, and and people know people know what they said. These 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 things come out. These these aren't secrets anymore. So yes, you've got to find um, the, the kind of people who you know when we put out the quotes and everything. Again, I, as a question for you, I, I, I didn't read from cover to cover the little book of humanism which came out recently, which was very, very successful. I would, I would, hope, I would hope that that did include um, a lot of uh, non-white male voices in it. Um, and if, if, it, if it didn't, then I hope that uh, when they do a second edition, they do. I think that, it's a difficult one, this, because in a way, it's difficult. I, I, so let's take philosophy again. In philosophy, you know, I had a philosophical education and the philosophical education had all these gaps. In a way, it wasn't my fault I didn't know these things. I didn't know about the many really interesting thinkers who were not uh, white and European and, and North American. Um, but once it's kind of pointed out that there are these gaps, you kind of still need help. You need to know where these things are, and, it, and it's quite difficult. So, for example, um, I've been really interested. There's this really interesting Ethiopian uh, Ziri Yaakov, who's a polymath, really, you know, not just a philosopher. And there's a conference being held, and really interesting. But I actually can't even get hold of uh, you know a translation of of the works. It's just not. It's just not available. So it's really really tough. So you know, I do think I do think that you're you're right. You're, I don't know how to do it effectively. And I think this is a, a good challenge for, for Humanist UK too. Um, but certainly, you know, if you know about these people, if you know about good sources, you know, I think try, try and push them and try and push them in, in, in outside the ABH as well. So they become part of the conversation. I mean, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I I agree with you, Audrey. I just think it's it's there's a long way to go, isn't there? It, and it's not just in humanism. This we have these same discussions in in philosophy, in art, in in music, in in literature. These people are there, you know. The the people of color are there, um, but they have been overlooked, and it takes time to get that kind of canon rewritten. Thank you, Audrey. Well, um, I'd like to ask Bill, Bill Stevenson, to, say, to ask his question now.
So you have to unmute yourself and hopefully turn on your camera as well. Uh, indeed, I'll do both those things. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, Julian, uh, thanks very much. Very interesting talk. Uh, I'm a member of our local philosophy group and we have read several of your books, particularly um, How the World Thinks, which you know, gives us a, a lot of ideas about how things work outside of the Western world in philosophy. But I'd, I'd just like to come back to one of your concepts about humanism and this idea of human exceptionalism. Um, I, you may well have read that book, uh, Sapiens, uh, that came out a couple of years ago by Yuval Noah Harari. And as, as a humanist, I was really upset by the description of humanism that he gave in that book, um, which seemed to imply that all humanists believe that humanists are, you know, that human beings are exceptional and, you know, special and that the whole world should revolve around us. What do you think we could do to correct that and explain that that's not the way modern humanists think? Yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, yeah, and in, in a way, I have to confess, you know, I, uh, it's one of those debates where actually I, I don't want to go too far the other way. I think humans, in, there is a sense in which humans are genuinely exceptional, you know, and I think that, uh, so I, I <laughs> in, in a way, I don't want to undermine myself, but I mean, if you, but what I don't think we are is of a completely different order to the rest of the natural world. That's the, the key point, right? right? I do think that there are certain things we have, which are capacities which other animals simply don't. It, but I think the point is we, we, what we have the capacity to do is to essentially um, reject our um, evolved destiny, if you like. You know, we, we choose not to have children, for example, which an animal would never do. An animal would never choose not to have children. An animal would never choose to sort of um, try and live in a completely different social form to the form in which its species was done. So in a way that, you know, there are ways in which we are exceptional, but we're not totally separate. We're not of a completely different order. Everything's a matter of degree. And I think the respect for um, other species should, should be something that humanists really value because they are driven by a kind of an evidence-based approach. And, and responding to, to the facts as they are. And we just know too much about the way animals are to, and, and the whole theory of evolution just smashes any division, sharp division between us and other species. So mm -hmm. how, how to overcome this? I mean, one thing to be said is that, you know, sometimes you can't overcome <laughs> constant caricature. So I don't like being critical of individuals named individuals so um but sometimes you you kind of have to be but i think for example i i, I will say i get i get very tired with you know john gray is in lots of ways a very interesting thinker and writer there's lots to admire in him but i do think the way in which he can, keeps going back to the idea that humanists and the like have this naive belief in the inevitability of progress. It's just not true. <laughs> it's just tedious to have to put up. And nothing we say is gonna stop him continuing to say it, right? <laughs> so in a way, some people are just gonna say these things. What, what can we do? Um, the, the only, so, so there's no simple way. It's just perhaps trying to remember that, particularly because humanist, it's got the word human in it. So it's going to like, every, almost every time you say the word, it reinforces it. Yeah. Um, Maybe in terms of campaigning strategies and campaigning priorities and information on websites, you know, I mean, I'd be very interested to know if you took a survey of, of humanist UK members, I know we've got international audience here, isn't it lovely? But, you know, um, we're, we're doing this under the umbrella of humanist UK. If you take a survey of humanist UK members and ask them uh, whether they believed that um, uh, more ought to be done to protect animal welfare in agriculture, et cetera, I would expect the vast majority to say yes. I would expect it to be a very popular cause. Mm -hmm. And in a way, maybe that should be a cause which is taken up because you know, the humanists do campaign on issues which are not 
uniquely humanist. So humanists have tended to, uh, you know, there's a lot of campaigns been around, for example, right, right to die, assisted, assisted suicide, mm -hmm. yeah. which is, which is not, I mean, it's not even, I mean, you could be a humanist and be against it, frankly, you know, I mean, it, it, most humanists are in favor of it for good reasons, but it's not an essentially humanist position, right? And so I think in the same kind of way, campaign for animal welfare is something which, which I think the vast majority of humanists would be in favor of, even though it's not, you know, something that is essentially a humanist position. Well, actually, in a way, I think it's almost more essentially a humanist position than right to life. I'm thinking out loud here, sorry about this. You know, <laughs> I, think of, I can think of very good humanist reasons not to want to liberalize um, laws around um, Right. I don't agree with them, but I can imagine good humanist reasons, but I can think of no good humanist reason to defend current industrial animal farming policies. I, I think you'd be inconsistent as a humanist to do that. Um, so I, maybe, maybe putting animal welfare as one of the campaigning priorities would, <laughs> would be a good way of doing that. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Bill. Right, I'd just like to ask Lola of Association of Black Humanists to ask her question, please. Um, it's, it's not particularly a question um, that I have. Um, I just want to respond to, you know, a few things that have been said about maybe Humanist UK, and maybe um, issues with um, diversity. And um, I wouldn't say I'm a representative of um, black people, um, but I will say from my experience with Humanist UK, because I think I like to be fair, and I think I'm always looking for, it is very difficult, you know, I'm always looking for, um, a balanced way of uh, looking at, at things. You know, if truth be said, I think there have been attempts and they have, they have tried. And um, we have uh, many members of uh, the Humanist UK, um, um, you know, people like Jeremy Rodell, um, Trisha, um, Alapama, and um, JC, Giovanni, a lot of people that I believe are invested um, in seeing that there is um, diversity and are given a lot of support to the cause. And I will also want to be honest that it is also a challenge for us, even as Black people. Um, I think the issues are very complex. And we are still, we are looking into things. We are looking at different projects. Um, I have been having um, discussion with um, JC and we are looking at, you know, what is it that we can do? It is very, very complex. And I don't think we know the answers. Um, I don't think we know the answers. Yeah, well, that's, that's, if I'm very honest, I think it's important to know that, you know, and uh, to acknowledge that. I think the important thing is that things stay on the agenda and they're discussed and they're, they're part of the conversation, you know. Um, and the other thing is, you know, there are very rarely, if ever, silver bullets for, for things like this, you know. And sometimes what's most effective is accidental, unforeseen, whatever it might be. Um, I think just keeping it on the agenda is, is really important. I guess one thing that really would help, if you think about it, would be um, a black president. I think the term is president. The president, I think, run, has about three-year terms. And we've, had some, we've had some fantastic presidents. They have been, you know, diverse in lots of ways, but I'm not, I'm not sure we've had a, a, a black president yet. We've had ethnic minority presidents, but not necessarily a black one. And, yeah, that sends that sends a signal, doesn't it? You know, it's 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 really it's really important. But that's not a panacea either. You know, I mean, when America got its first black president, four years later, you had Donald Trump in the White House. <laughs> so.
super, thank you. Um, so we are, I've got to say, running out of questions, or we have run out of questions. Um, there was one which somebody asked, which I can't remember who it was, who it was but I'll just say it anyway. And that was, they, they, they were wondering if you could go over that aspect of your thoughts that they are um, underpinnings for humanism from different cultures, which will put humanism on a firmer footing and what those underpinnings were, what were those ideas, what were those thoughts, what were those? Yeah, I think I, I haven't been, so I, obviously my attention has been quite focused. I, mean, it's a, I, I saw something like that on the chat and it's not that I think that, um, you know, I think a lot of the underpinnings are, uh, are perfectly good, but I think we can get more underpinnings, right? Uh, okay, so what are, what are the key things? I think, I think so here, here, okay, so here's I think the key things. One, a more relational understanding of, of human beings, right? So again, this is a matter of emphasis, but I, in this book on comparative philosophy, the, the person I quote, and I, every time I talk about the book, I always quote Tom Kasulis, right? Because he says something really important. He says that when people are looking at comparative thought, comparative philosophy, they, they are very simple, very easily slip into these kind of binaries. So they say the West is individualist and the East is collectivist or, you know, whatever it might be. And he says, it's never like that. It's about foreground and background, you know, the same elements occur in all traditions of thoughts, but in some traditions, they slip into the background and almost become invisible and others they're right in the foreground. I think foregrounding more the relational aspect of our humanity is really important. And a lot of non-Western traditions get resources to help us to do that. That's one. Two, I'd say the whole thing about nature, our place in nature. I think that um, despite the fact that we're committed naturalists, it's difficult to escape that kind of way of thinking in which nature is somehow something else, you know, humanity and nature. I mean, people still say things like, you know, humans are ruining nature. And the very statement suggests that humans are not part of nature in a way, uh, not, not literally, but sometimes they do. So I think that thinking of our relationship with the natural world the important one and i think the third one is, is again a, a more expansive notion of, of what reason and rationality means and to recognize the fact that there are many ways of, of really using our brains to understand the world better which are not necessarily matters of scientific method or philosophical logic so i mean those are the three main things for me which i think would just in, in, enrich us uh, other things, there are other things, but I suppose those are the three most important ones. So just to reiterate those. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, so unless we've got any more questions, I'm going to call the uh, proceedings to a halt. And, oh, sorry, we've got, we definitely do have one more question <laughs> from, <laughs> sorry about that, Tricia Rogers. So I just asked Tricia to say her question, please. Oh. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Clive. Well, I just wanted to follow up in a way the discussion with, with Nola and with, um, you know, how to increase the diversity. I mean, Humanist UK or British Humanist Association did have Shafiq or Sandy, so that was slightly a minority, but not very. That's the, the closest they've had, I think, to a minority president. But I was trying to think why it's harder to attract people. And is it partly that um, people um, of, of African, of African uh, heritage tend to have very lively churches and very lively mosques. It's an important part of their culture. And the church is being much more sort of successful and dynamic in those cultures. Whereas, you know, the Church of England seems to have become rather out of touch with most people and, and most young people don't find it. Not, not all churches, but the large, vast majority of them, there are a few lively ones. So is it to do with just a cultural thing that the church there, um, the, the, the black led churches, and I mean, I live in Southwark and they're incredibly lively and active here in Southwark and, and they just seem to be very successful in filling a need for people. And therefore whether the people really believe there's a God in a way isn't so important that that is something they enjoy the culture of those churches 
Yeah, I mean, Trisha, it's, I mean, it's a very good point because I think that, again, too often I think that people make the assumption that, you know, re religion is a matter of belief and if the beliefs are false, then that's the end of the story. Mm -hmm. um, but, but religion is actually an important part of our culture and community and society. I was religious when I was younger and I went to a Methodist church and the thing that I most appreciated about it was the community and it's what I kind of regretted giving up when I decided I couldn't really go anymore in good faith. Uh, what I probably didn't realise was I could have continued to go probably as an atheist and I probably would have been fine, you know? Yes. Uh, <laughs> people don't necessarily push these things. And I think maybe this is one of those ways in which what might help is 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 to... And I think, I think that... I think that several years ago, Humanist, British Humanist Association perhaps did spend more of its time being kind of anti-religious. And I think that it shifted over the years correctly, in my view, to kind of be, be more about the positive message of humanism to take on broader issues and to challenge religious power and authority and excess, but not religion per se. And it's worked, for example, with religious groups around um, education issues very, very effectively. So I think that perhaps one thing that's important here is that to sort of go a bit further with that in a way. And like, you know, you don't have to turn your back on your church to become a humanist. It might sound paradoxical, but you don't because your church could be your community, part of your extended family, part of your heritage, part of, part of you know, and part of your identity in a way. But if you find you can no longer believe what's being held there then you have a home in humanism and but you can have a home here without having to sort of like leave that one completely too you know um so finding ways of getting that message across might be might be useful well that's quite and, difficult if the with you have to say a creed and things that you strongly don't believe in yeah but you know priests say these things and don't believe in those <laughs> They do. There are priests who sit there doing it, and in their head, it's just metaphor, metaphor, metaphor. You know, um, we know a lot. Jeremy and I know a lot of them. Um, <laughs> so, um, anyway, but anyway, but thanks for that. I want to say because we might be wrapping up soon, but can I just last with me? Can I just thank everyone for, for coming along? It's really Zoom is so tiring, there's too many things, and um. Um, thanks for coming along and, and, and also sticking at it as well. You know, Zoom is brutal. It lists the number of participants at the bottom. So if people start leaving, you really do know. And I'm really, really grateful that so almost everyone has stuck around the whole time. And so thank you so much. And thank you so much, um, yeah, Clive Lola, uh, for inviting me and making me so welcome. Thank you very much. We really enjoyed that. Thank you. Could everybody please give a Round of applause, please. Okay. okay. So, um, well, as I said before, I really do hope that we get to do this again. It was great. And uh, you can't have too much of a good thing when it comes to being <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Dr. Bajini. Okay, thank you so much. So, Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Okay. Right. Um, just to sort of say that, again, we are around every month, so do you kind of stick with us. Um, if you but meet us and meet up and see what we're up to. So the newcomers, please keep coming back. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.